a Sunday school teacher just finished telling her junior's group about how Jesus was crucified and then he was placed in a tomb and a great stone sealing the tomb. Then she wanted to share the excitement of the resurrection and she asked, and what do you think that Jesus' first words were when he came out of the tomb? A hand shot up in the air from the back. And it was that of a little girl's. Leaping out of the chair, she shouted excitedly, I know, I know what he said. Good, said the teacher. Come forward and tell us what Jesus' first words were when he came out of the tomb. Extending her arms high in the air, she looked at everybody and said, Ta-da! <laughs> Funny, isn't it? In her innocence, she said something that came to her mind. But when you pause and think about it, it is indeed the Tada moment of Christianity. Jesus said many things in the scriptures. Jesus said to Martha, I am the resurrection and life. The one who believes in me will live even if he's dead. And the one who believes in me will never die. Do you believe this Martha? Yes. He looked at the Samaritan woman and said, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them, they will never be thirsty indeed. The water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. What is the use of believing in a person who said these words and has died? The most quoted verse in the New, uh, New Testament, for God so loved the world that he gave his son, Everyone who believes in him will have everlasting life. What is the use of believing in those words when the one in whom you are putting your belief is dead? Never to come back to life again. All of the sayings of Jesus can be trusted because he came back from the dead and now he lives. William Lane Craig, a noted apologist, said this, Without the belief in the resurrection, the Christian faith could have never come into existence. The disciples would have remained crushed and defeated men, even if they would have continued to remember their uh, Jesus as their beloved teacher, his crucifixion would have forever silenced any hope of the Messiah. For Jesus, the cross would have remained a sad, sad and a shameful end. Only in the view of resurrection, it could be seen as the event by which the forgiveness of sins was obtained. The origin of Christianity hinges on the belief that God raised Jesus from the dead. The resurrection of Christ, the very basis and foundation of our Christian faith. The resurrection was of great and uh, it was a great emphatic point in whole of the New Testament. In the sermon of Peter on the day of Pentecost, he said, This Jesus that God has raised up from the dead, whereof we are all witnesses. When the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit, one central result was that with great power, the Bible says, the, the power gave the apostles to witness to the resurrection of the Lord. The central doctrine of Apostle Paul preached on Marcel in Acts chapter 17 to the philosophers was resurrection of Christ. Later on when Jews caught Paul in the temple in Acts chapter 26 they sought to kill him because he was preaching about the resurrection of Christ. So the resurrection of the Christ is the basis of our faith. The resurrection is everything for the Christian faith. I'm not saying that the crucifixion doesn't have any value. The crucifixion loses its meaning without the resurrection. The resurrection is not just another thing we believe as Christians, but it's rather the heart and foundation of our faith. In our passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the resurrection of the dead is one of the first major topics in the second half of Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Here is an important bit that you need to know before we move on with this passage. Just a surface reading of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 might suggest that Paul is responding to the Corinthians because of their disbelief in the resurrection of the dead or they don't believe in life after death. 
That's not the case. By denying the resurrection of the dead, the Corinthians were almost certainly not denying life after death. Virtually everyone in the, old, uh, in the ancient world believed in it. Rather, they were disputing the Jewish and the Christian doctrine of bodily resurrection and endorsing one form of the Greek uh, disembodied immortality of the soul. So Paul was addressing this particular issue in that particular uh, chapter, the issue of bodily resurrection, but not general life and life after death. Paul's structure was like this. When you look at the first couple of verses and then from 12 to 19, Paul first gives a defense of the evidence of Jesus resurrection and then he moves on to build his argument about the resurrection of the dead based on Christ's resurrection. We are going to do the same but we are going to look a few aspects in more depth uh, this evening. There are three themes that I'll be taking you through. These are the three themes. The first is the evidence for the event of Christ's resurrection. The second is, okay, Christ did come back to life. What did the resurrection do for us? Answer, it justified us. And the third theme, what does the resurrection do for us? Answer, it gives us a hope of eternal security. So these are the three themes that we'll be touching upon today. Uh, some of you who have attended the morning service might find the last one a bit repetitive, but I've tried my best to keep it new. The first one, the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus. In our contemporary culture, when you say that Jesus is risen and alive, you know, usually the response that I get is, come on, Seidel, do you still believe that thing? Come on, we are in the 21st century, and how can a dead man come back to life? When we are addressing such a question such as that, even before you present the evidence, we need to consider two main things that we need to establish. The first one is the prophetic aspect of Christ's resurrection and the second is his death on the cross. These are the two things that we need to establish even before giving the evidence and that's what I'll be doing now. Jesus' resurrection didn't just happen like that. It was prophesied several hundreds of years before his birth. The prophet Isaiah in chapter 53 says, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer and though the Lord makes his life an offering to sin after he has suffered he will see the light of life and be satisfied in his knowledge my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities several hundred years before the birth of Christ Isaiah prophesies that Jesus is going to come back to life Psalm 16 10 says God will not let his holy one see corruption he has to die because he has to pay the price for the sin, but he will not let his Holy One see corruption like everyone else. He's going to raise him back to life. And also, there are close to 15 references in the whole of the Gospels where Jesus predicted his own resurrection. The point to be noted is that Jesus never predicted his death without adding that he would come back to life. There are close to 15 of these references. So there is this prophetic element to it. And the second important point we need to establish is that Jesus died. It might sound a bit silly, but it is a very important aspect of our faith that we need to establish that Jesus died. Because there is no point in defending the resurrection if he didn't die. And the reason I say this is, there are many people out there that we might not have come across yet, but they're actually denying the death of Christ. Muslims clearly deny that Jesus didn't die. Muslims actually believe that Jesus is the greatest, one of the great prophets of uh, Islam. But they never believe that Jesus died. In their book, Quran, chapter 4, verse 157, the Arabic verse says, Vama kataluhu, vama salabuhu. They neither killed him nor crucified him. It just appeared to be so. Hindu philosopher Swami Vivekananda, in one of, the, one of his interviews, he was the, actually the first person to bring Hinduism to the West, Swami Vivekananda. In his interview, he said, I don't think so they could have killed Jesus because he was so holy. 
Do you know what these people are actually doing by denying the death? They're denying the possibility of the resurrection. If there is no death, no resurrection. No resurrection, Christianity collapses. Michael Green says, Christianity stands or falls with the truth of the resurrection and once you have disproved the resurrection, you have disputed Christianity and Christianity can close down. Once a young lady wrote to her pastor, Dear Pastor, a professor at university said that on Easter, Jesus actually didn't die. He just fainted on the cross. And when his disciples took back and nursed him, he became well. What do you think? Signed, you're sincerely confused. The pastor thought for a while and he replied to her, Dear confused, please take a whip of three to four cords and tie a metal piece or a small bone at the end of each cord and go and take that uh, whip and beat your professor with it. Give him 40 to 50 heavy strokes, both front and back. Nail him onto a cross, hang him there in the sun for a couple of hours, then run a spear through his side and put him in an airless chamber for 30 odd hours and see what happens. I hope that will answer your question. Signed, God bless your pastor. I don't want to get into medical theories, but there are several medical journals that have been published where they say that there is no way that a person could have survived that kind of torture and suffering. They even pierced him to make sure that he's dead. And people are denying that Christ didn't die. Please do keep those two in mind. The prophetic element of Christ's resurrection and the death of Jesus Christ. Now, moving to the first theme, the evidence for the resurrection. Do you know, if you start looking for the evidence of Christ's resurrection, you'll be just overwhelmed. You'll be just overwhelmed. In the beginning of the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, Paul begins by giving the eyewitness evidences of Jesus. He says, For what I received, I passed on to you as first importance. That Christ died according to, for our sins according to scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the twelve. And after that he appeared to more than 500 of brothers and sisters at the same time. Most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. And at last he appeared to me also. The appearances of Jesus Christ after his resurrection. That particular list is not an exhaustive list. There are close to 15 separate appearances of Jesus after he came back to life in the New Testament. Some of the ones that Paul did not cover in that are, he appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to two disciples on the Emmaus Road. He appeared to Stephen when he was being stoned. He appeared to John in the island of Patmos when John was writing the book of Revelation. Jesus was clearly seen. Thomas called Didymus the doubter. He didn't actually believe that Jesus came back to life. He was the actual disciple of Jesus and he has been with Jesus, listening to Jesus about these prophecies. And he said, unless and until I put my finger on those pierced side and his uh, hands and feet, I will not believe that Jesus came back to life. Jesus appears to Thomas and says, Thomas, stop doubting and start believing. Come and feel the pierced side. Thomas goes in front of Jesus, he looks at Jesus, feels the pierced side. Right then he confesses. And actually in Greek it says, Ho kurios miu, kai ho theos miu, the Lord of me, the God of me. The English translation is, my God, my Lord and my God. Doubts have been transformed into confidence that his Savior came back from life, from death. The first one, his appearances. The second one, the grave clothes. Someone came up with this strange theory that, I mean, actually it was there in the Bible. Uh, the Roman guards were given money to say that the disciples stole the body away. Now the point is, if disciples did steal the body away, why did they fold the grave clothes and kept it in the tomb? Why do you want to strip a dead body naked and take it? grave clothes. 
The third one, hard critics became followers of Christ. That is the evidence for the resurrection. Paul, who was called a Saul, started killing these Christians. He says that I'm the worst of all sinners because I've killed Christians. He appeared to him, changed his heart, and he became a follower of Christ. Hard critics became followers and evidence of Christ's resurrection. His disciples were transformed. When you look at how the disciples behaved, when Jesus uh, was arrested, Peter denied him thrice. James and John, men of thunder, Boanerges, where were they when he was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane? When Jesus was before the Pilate and Herod, where were his disciples? Hiding somewhere? But when they have seen the risen Savior after he came back from the dead, their fears were turned into joy and they were turned into confidence and courage. They were not even afraid to die. When I was doing a mission week, someone asked me, Seidel, you say that apostles died for, but they were not afraid to die for Jesus. So are Muslims, for their God Allah, what's the difference? Doesn't prove that the God is true. Well, Muslims die because of the belief in Allah. It's just a belief. The disciples died because they witnessed their Savior. A personal witness. They are dying for a belief. These people are dying because they witnessed the Savior. And Christians all over the world are dying because they have a personal relationship with Christ. And they witnessed the love of God in their lives. There are many more evidences that Jesus rose from the dead. Actually, Jesus ate with his disciples. If he didn't have a body, how can he eat? And so on. So if you want to know more about the evidences, please do come for the apologetics course. And the second one, what did the resurrection do for us? Paul in verse 17 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Some of you might be thinking that the death of Christ paid for my sins. What has the resurrection got to do with the forgiveness of my sins? Because we have often heard that Jesus died on the cross. He has taken our sins. So we are forgiven. So what has resurrection to do with my forgiveness when Jesus already died on the cross? Here is the difference. Most of you might have heard the word justification. If you have attended any of our Bible studies or the apologetics course, you would have never missed that word. Justification in Christian theology or doctrine means this. Because, Christ, because of Christ, our sins are forgiven. And due to Christ's righteousness, we are declared righteous in the sight of God. That's what justification means. Paul in Romans chapter 4 verse 25 says, Jesus was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. I think the slide would be really helpful here because I've made a... Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Really? But yeah, it's just that magical touch. There you go. Justification. Justification is something by which we become righteous. Keeping that in mind, let's read the First Corinthians passage again. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, you are still in your sins, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. Can you see the link between justification and the resurrection? If Jesus had died on the cross and not risen from the dead, how could we be sure that God has accepted his sacrifice and that our sins were completely forgiven? By raising Jesus from the dead, God showed that we are justified in Christ. God the Father, in effect, was saying that he approved Christ's work of suffering and dying on the cross, that his work was completed and Christ no longer had to remain dead. There was no more penalty left for, to pay for sin, no more wrath of God to bear. 
Can you see what I have in my hand? A big receipt is actually a big receipt. It's an Asda receipt. What is the purpose of this receipt? It, it, it tells you what, what's, what you paid for the stuff on there. Yes, so that means that I owed something. A receipt is a proof when that big person at the counter, at the, uh, uh, at the store, he stops you if that thing beeps to make sure that you actually paid for what you bought, right. doesn't he? The resurrection of Christ was the receipt that God accepted our, his sacrifice on the cross and due to which now we are forgiven of our sins. Just before dying, Jesus said, it's finished. It was finished from his end. He did everything that he should have done for our sins to be forgiven. He took our sins upon him and he died and he said, it's finished after raising Jesus from the dead God might have said and now it is finished from his end the work of salvation is done it's now up to the people to receive it through Christ at the cross my sinful life was wiped clean I was justified and made righteous I was a sinner God looks at me and says that you're a sinner but I see my son took your cross your sins and he died on the cross so now because of his righteousness i'm going to justify you in your faith by your faith so we are clean a new creation in christ that's how justification works and when you take the word mercy this is something unique to the christian faith when you take the word mercy Mercy always comes at the expense of a judgment. It always comes at the expense of a judgment by definition. It's like, hey, I found you guilty of committing this crime. This is the punishment that you're going to get. But because I'm a gracious person, I'm going to extend my mercy on you. I'm going to forgive you. It comes at the expense of the judgment by definition. It's the same in any religion, except in Christianity. In Christian faith, mercy comes through the judgment. I'm not overlooking the judgment. The judgment, the price has been paid by Jesus. So the mercy comes through judgment in the Christian faith. This doctrine of justification might be complicated for some of you here. Catherine Wheeler wrote a fantastic poem. She calls it The New Leaf, which brilliantly summarizes the doctrine of justification. And here it is. He came to my desk with a quivering lip. The lesson was done. Have you a new sheet for me, dear teacher? I have spoiled this one. I took his sheet all soiled and blotted and gave him a new one all unspotted. Into his tired heart I cried, do better now, my child. I went to the throne of God with a trembling heart. The day was done. Have you a new life for me, dear God? I have spoiled this one. He took my life all soiled and blotted and gave me a new life all unspotted. And to my tired heart he cried, do better now, my child. That is justification. The resurrection of Christ has justified us in the sight of God. If Christ is raised, that means we are no longer in our sinful nature. Our faith is not futile. My faith is based in the confidence of a Savior who is risen and still lives. What did the resurrection do for, for us? It justified us in the sight of God. Thirdly and finally, what does the resurrection do for us? It gives us a hope of eternal security. The resurrection of Christ gives us hope that one day we shall also be raised up bodily just as Christ was to live with him for eternity. The resurrection of the dead is mentioned close to 104 times in the New Testament. The resurrection of Christ confirms our resurrection. 
in essence, if you're celebrating the resurrection of Christ, you're actually celebrating your future hope of your resurrection. In verse 20 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul says that Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. It's a very good analogy there. Now Christ is the first one to be resurrected. He's the first fruits. And do you know when the farmer checks his field, he would take a little bit from every section of the field and he puts it together. And that would represent the first fruits. And if the first fruits were good, that means it's a guaranteed good crop, a good harvest. That was the role of the first fruits. And Paul compares Jesus as our first fruits from the dead. Jesus came out of that grave. He was the guarantee that the harvest of every other godly life will be as good as his was. He was the first fruits and it shall continue. And because his resurrection was valid, so will ours be. He's the guarantee of our resurrection. How beautiful are the words of Jesus when he said, because I live, you shall live also. Because I live, you shall live also. 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 verse 3 to 4 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade, kept in heaven for you. What an assurance. You know this eternal hope not only it gets you that eternal inheritance, but it also gives you the confidence to live your life in spite of the trials and temptations that you face. Let me illustrate that. Once a preacher had a conversation with a circus trapeze artist. The performer admitted that the net underneath was there to keep them from breaking their necks and bodies. But he added, it also helps us to keep us from falling. Imagine if there was no net. We would be so nervous that we would be more likely to miss and fall during our moves. If there wasn't a net, we would not dare to do some of the things that we do. But because there's a net, we dare to make turns in the air. And once I made three turns, thanks to the net, which gave me the confidence. So the two advantages of the net, it keeps you safe, gives you the confidence to make turns in the air. Two advantages of our eternal hope in Christ. Not only you gain the eternal inheritance, as it was promised, but it also gives you the confidence to live your life in spite of trials and temptations that we go through. We have security in God. We are sure of our security because we are in His hands. Because Christ lives, I don't have to worry about that tomorrow because he's already there for me. All that I need to do is trust in him and he'll take care of me. In the last two weeks, um, I attended two funerals. Pat Waterhouse's and Ted Dean's. The family members, the church members and the friends were mourning the loss of these people. And in both the short sermons, the only hope that the minister gave was that as believers, we are going to meet them one day. No other faith does that. No other faith does that. We have that surety that we are going to meet our loved ones. If that person is saved, I'm going to meet them in heaven. And together, we are going to glorify and praise our Savior. No other uh, faith does that. Actually, a couple of um, uh, weeks back, I was debating at Bournemouth University with the Dorset humanists. It was a tough debate. I was replying to one question, and suddenly I said something after which everyone booed at me as in everyone, as in the humanists. I was like surprised. All that I said was, it's only the Christians who have the hope of eternal security. And there went boo and everything in the whole of lecture theater. That there was a lot of unease in the lecture theater because I said that. 
still stand by my statement. It's only the Christian who has the surety of eternal security and no one else in this world. Hindus don't have it. Buddhists don't have it. Muslims are not even sure whether they're going to get into heaven because at the end everything it depends upon the will of their God Allah and they can't be sure of anything. They don't have a surety. Some of the Jews don't even believe in the resurrection. Unlike them we have the surety, the assurance and the biggest proof of evidence of your surety is that you can confirm it with your risen Savior Jesus Christ because he lives. There was this American soldier at Vietnam who wrote this poem. It's a brilliant poem. His name is Hadi Shoal. He says this, Lord God, I have never spoken to you, but now I want to say, how do you do? You see, God, they told me that you didn't exist. Like a fool, I believed all this. Last night, from a shell hole, I saw your sky. I figured right then that they told me a lie. Had I taken time to see the things you made, I'd have known they weren't calling a spade a spade. I wonder, God, if you'd take my hand. Somehow I feel that you'll understand. Funny I had to come to this hellish place before I had time to see your face. Well, I guess there isn't much more to say, but I'm sure glad, God, that I met you today. I guess the zero hour will be here soon. I'm not afraid since I know you're near. The signal, well, God, I have to go. I like you a lot, I want you to know. Look, this will be a horrible fight. Who knows, I may come to your house tonight. Though I wasn't friendly to you before, I wonder, God, if you would wait at your door. Look, I'm crying, I'm shedding tears. I have to go now, God. Goodbye. Strange now since I met you, I'm not afraid to die. The confidence and the surety that comes through belief in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me quickly finish with an illustration that I shared this morning. There was this uh, big preacher who was known for his illustrations and one day his wife died. And as he was standing in front of the coffin, he had his little girl beside him. The little girl looked at her dad and said, Daddy, in the church you always said that Jesus died for us. If Jesus died for us, why did mommy has to die? In her own little worldview, that was a very reasonable question. This preacher, known for his illustrations, didn't know what to say. He looked at her and said, just give me some time, I'll answer that. As they were going to the cemetery, they stopped at a traffic signal. Beside their van, there stopped a huge tractor trailer. And the, tractor tra and the sun was shining bright, and the trailer's uh, shadow was on the sidewalk. He looked at that, looked at his daughter and said, Honey, if you would have to be run over, would you choose the truck or the shadow of the truck? She said, Daddy, if it's the truck, I'm going to die. I'd rather choose the shadow of the truck. That's what Christ has done. He took the judgment of God, which is the truck, on him, so that the shadow, which is our death, goes through you and me now. For Christians, death is not an end. It's the beginning of a glorious eternity. Death can never scare a Christian because we have the assurance that because Christ lives, we will also live with him. He was raised as the first fruits. So shall after we die, we will be raised like him and we will be with him. The three things the evidence for the resurrection that it happened. What did the resurrection do for us? It justified us in the sight of God. What does the resurrection do for us in future? It gives us a hope of eternal security. What a mighty, amazing Savior we have, the risen Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know where you are in your faith. If you have already accepted Christ, well done. Uh, let me encourage you to grow in that day by day. Grow firm in your faith and in a relationship with the triune God. If you have accepted Christ yes. and you think that you're falling away, I think it's the best time to come back and rededicate your life to Christ.
and start living your life with more care. If you have not yet accepted Christ, this is the best moment to do that. A Muslim in Africa became a Christian and some of his friends asked him, why have you done such a thing? He answered, well, it's like this. Suppose you were going down the road and suddenly the road divided into two. And at the point where the road divided, there was a dead person and a person who's alive. Whom will you go and ask to show you the way? Jesus said he is the way. If someone's trying to disprove the resurrection of Christ, there's enough evidence to prove that it actually happened. Pagan historians, Roman historians, Greek historians, Jewish historians have agreed that Jesus died. These are recorded as history books. How can they even deny that Jesus didn't die and come back to life? As Christians, we always need to be ready to give a reason for the hope that is within us with gentleness and respect. That's what 1 Peter 3.15 says. We are not asked to believe in the doctrine of the resurrection. We are asked to believe this person who was raised from the dead. And that's the point that we need to always focus on when we proclaim this risen Christ. Let us pray. Our most gracious family, Father, we thank you for the word that you have given us, Lord. Father, thank you for teaching that Christ has justified us and through Christ we have a hope of eternal security. Yes, Lord, there's a lot of evidence to prove that Jesus came back from the dead. Help us to explain that well to the skeptics and the agnostics. Father, personally, we pray that you will make this experience of the resurrection more real to us in our walk with you. We pray that you'll meet with each one of us. Help us to walk with you and to grow more in our spirit. We pray that our lives will be used for your glory and honor and also as an example to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.